But the human race is broken and fragmented. No matter how nice and sweet people may seem on the outside, their lives are fragmented and broken. There's only one Savior, Jesus Christ, and He has come to save. He has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Oh, and here's what I want to end by saying. And, and everybody's saying it's restarted. Thank you all. Yes, great, wonderful. Wonderful. You see, evangelicals, here's where we are different from many evangelicals. Baptists, Presbyterians, whatever they may be. Hey, and, and don't get me wrong, I love evangelicals. They have given us, they've brought to us the emphasis on the Bible being the Word of God and on salvation, being born again, etc., etc., And I love the evangelicals. Evangelicals pull back, though, from what we would call this full salvation of saving us everywhere we've been broken. And even, you know, part of the brokenness, I'll just say this because of who we are, part of the brokenness is, is, is the hostility and the breakdown between the sexes, between the genders. Uh, because in Genesis, in the creation, there was complete perfect mutuality and partnership. But, but the breakdown between the sexes came with the fall. And so a part of us being saved is being saved in this area as well. Hallelujah. Now, also, we want to be, we believe in the salvation that God wants to save all of us, the healing of our bodies, the healing of our lives, whether it's emotionally or whatever it may be. Now, let me say this. There's probably never going to be a time where everything, where I've arrived, everything is perfect. Life is a process. But there is substantial healing that we can live in and walk in now. In every area of our lives. And Sue, I'm going to share this little story. Uh, what is the name of that missionary conference you were at? Was it 1974 that you were at the Urbana Missionary Conference? I got it. Steve was there too. Were you really? Yes. Sue and Steve. I didn't know you were both there. There were a bunch of people from St. John. This was, an, uh, this was a, a huge missionary conference attended uh, by thousands of young people, college students from all over America, North America, and they meet at, is it the University of Illinois, I believe? Uh, uh, in Champaign, Illinois, and, uh, and so uh, in this huge stadium, thousands of people there, and it was that night, uh, this particular night, Sue has shared this many times, she heard Elizabeth Elliot, Elizabeth Elliot, um, powerful woman of God, I would not suggest that you take her teachings on gender roles because she's very traditional, but some of us egalitarians could learn a thing or two from her about commitment to Christ. And Sue heard her speak that night and her heart was deeply touched because Elizabeth Elliot, she and her husband Jim Elliot and, and about three or four other couples went to South America together to reach a remote Indian tribe called the Akua Indians. And, uh, and, and they would fly over them and they would drop out materials and gifts to them. And when they thought that they had uh, established maybe some rapport, the four men landed on a beach and their wives were there eagerly waiting for them to come back and tell them what would happen. But they never came back. They lost radio transmission. They didn't come back because when the Akua Indians made contact with them, they murdered them. They killed them. And what later happened was these same four women, their wives whose husbands had been murdered, they went back to these same Indian tribes and led them to Christ. And when this Indian tribe saw the love of Christ in them and the forgiveness of Christ, <laughs> the entire tribe turned to Jesus. <laughs> Folks, our egalitarianism is worth nothing if we don't show the love of Christ to the world. I'll say that again. Our egalitarian is worth nothing if we don't show the love of Christ to the world. 
And so, so these women went back to this, made contact with this same tribe. Same people, very same individuals that had murdered their husbands. They led them to Christ, told them about Jesus and His love and showed His love. Led them to Christ. The entire tribe turned to Christ. And Sue was listening that night to Elizabeth Elliot, 1974. I'd never seen Sue before. No, that was before 1974 because you came to CFNI in 1974. It must have been about what, 1970? Nineteen seventy-three, and I was back in northeast Texas. I'll tell you what was happening with me. And Sue was just so deeply touched by what she had heard that night. She went back to her room and just was listening to God, and, and opened her living Bible. And she heard God speak to her and say. I don't want you to go with this group. This is a good group. They love God. But I don't want you to attach yourself to this group because... And she opened her living Bible and this is what she read. God always has shown us that these messages are, that these messages are true by signs and wonders and various miracles and by giving certain special abilities from the Holy Spirit to those who believe. Yes, God has assigned such gifts to each of us. And even though this message that night was so powerful, it showed something that so many charismatics and prophetic people saw them they do not have today, that, that depth of commitment to Christ. And that's what God is calling us to tonight. Because, folks, yes, we're a family. Joel was talking about this family. Yes, folks, God has connected. Many of us on here tonight, God has connected us by the Spirit. You know it in your hearts, many of you. Many of you support us in prayer and, and sacrificially with financial gifts. And, and we are so thankful. We're believing God to bless you more and more. But I know that God is calling us <laughs> oh, to a greater depth of commitment to Him because of where He's taking us. Folks, He's taking us to places none of us have ever been before. God is going to do things we've never seen before. God is going to impact this world in ways we haven't seen before, but it's going to require a greater depth of commitment than we have known before. I was sitting up here earlier today on the couch this afternoon all along, and I was sitting here and, and I began to think about how Jesus walked along the shores of Galilee. And he, he, he began to call people to come and follow me and how they left all their fishermen's nets and everything, their families, and they left it all to follow Jesus. And I looked up and I saw this painting on the wall that was given us to buy our dear friend um, uh, Azalea Erpel Jordan down in uh, uh, Paris, uh, Paris, Texas. A dear friend, up close to 90 years old, gave me this painting. I stopped in to see she and her husband who just passed away. And she gave me this painting. I looked up and I saw the painting. And there's what I was thinking about that was bringing tears to my eyes. Jesus walking along the shores of Galilee. And he's calling, saying, come and follow me. And certain ones are leaving everything to follow him. And my friends, that doesn't mean that you do something presumptuous, that you jump up and, and quit your job or do this or that. But it means that right now, tonight, if you haven't already do this, you say, Lord, I put myself and all that I am and I have in your hands. <laughs> and Lord, I'm willing to go. I'm willing to stay. <laughs> Whatever you want me to do, oh God. <laughs> I belong to you and everything that I have and am is yours. And right now, Lord, I put myself in your hands. I am yours, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, and I sensed this this afternoon as I was praying here. And then Sue, when I went down later, Sue said, here's the song for tonight. And it was that song by Robin Mark. And if you want to play that again at some point, Sue... Uh, but let me just talk a little bit more here. When it's all been said and done, there is just one thing that matters. Did I do my best to live for truth? 
Did I live my life for truth? Did I live my life for Him? Yes. And I want to read this. God has always shown us that these messages are true by signs and wonders and various miracles. Folks, believe with us. God wants to bring forth signs and wonders and miracles. It's not something we're chasing after. I, I, I've been around this movement for years. All my life, I grew up in it. And one thing that I've noticed is that so often people become more preoccupied with what they do than with God Himself. They get preoccupied with what God does. And then they want God to keep doing what He does. And then they begin, they get, to, uh, they become manipulative. And they become less and less than honest trying to make things happen and get God to do what they saw Him do before. And they start pursuing what they saw God do instead of pursuing God Himself. We're not interested in that. But folks, I know two things tonight. God's calling us to a new level of commitment to Him. And God is calling us to believe Him. To do signs and wonders like we've never seen before. And when Sue was having this experience down in Urbana, Illinois where God was speaking to her, I don't, I don't, yeah, this is wonderful what you've heard tonight. But I don't want you to connect with this group because I have always shown that my message is true by signs and wonders and various miracles. And I want you to start believing God for miracles in your life. That when you pray for people, one of the terrible things about the healing ministry in the United States has been so professionalized and the professional healers purvey the idea that you've got to come and see them to get healed or, or say, so, oh no, you don't have to go see anybody. You have a personal Savior, but God wants to use you to bring healing to your family, to your friends, to your associates right where you are. And when this was happening with Sue, I'd never met Sue, never laid eyes on her, didn't know she existed, but I was down in northeast Texas. And around this same time this was happening, my friends Charles and Delilah were on tonight. Charles and I were in a little prayer room in a little church in northeast Texas one Sunday afternoon. Very shy. It was hard for me to put my hand up in a service. I couldn't get up and give a testimony. I couldn't get up in front of people. But my heart was hungry for God. We were walking around a little Sunday school room before Sunday evening service. Had no leadership role in the service. Just sat in the audience and the only thing people know, knew about me, I was this, this quiet, shy person that never said anything. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Now I have a hard time stopping. <laughs> but we were in the Sunday school room. We were walking around praying. Charles and I and another fellow named Rula. And some of you read my book, Revival of Fire, you read this. Oh, and we're just lifting up our hearts to God quietly because we're too shy to make too much noise. <laughs> and there's probably nobody around yet anyway. We're just, we've been talking, we're just walking around, and we've never seen anything like this happen before. And we've been doing this for months. Suddenly, it's like the windows of heaven open and the glory of God descends upon us. And all of a sudden, Charles falls into the floor and he's lying in the floor weeping. And then all of a sudden... My other friend, he falls in the floor. We didn't know we were supposed to have catchers and claws to put over them. So <laughs> we hadn't read that in the Bible, so we did. <laughs> and anyway, so I'm walking along, and, and Charles is lying on the floor, and the rules rang for him, and, and Charles is weeping profusely, loudly. And all of a sudden, I feel something I've never felt before. I feel this burning heat, and it feels like a hot liquid. It's, it starts right here, and it's spreading across my chest very slowly. It feels real hot and thick. Just slowly, it goes in my shoulders, and I feel it coming down my elbows. And all of a sudden, I'm walking back and forth, and I open my mouth, and I begin to prophesy. First time I'd ever experienced a gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's like heaven has manifested and come down. And I don't know how long this lasted and went on. But after a while when we get up, we're in awe of what we've just experienced. We've never seen anything, experienced anything like it before. And we sit down and we're talking. And my friend Charles, who's on tonight, him and Delilah are looking right there at us. And 
And, and Margaret, in Belenislow, Margaret and Sean, we're all going down with Charles and Delilah, and we're going to have some meetings again. Hallelujah, here just in a few days. And uh, Charles said that when he was lying on the floor, he said, he was sharing this with me, he said, my, the palms of my hand were burning like fire. It was almost painful. And he said, the heat was going up my elbows, my arms to my elbows. Now, if I had been like some people today, I would have said, no, that couldn't have been God because it, it comes from your shoulders down. See, that's how I was experiencing it. Don't try to impose your experience on anybody else. Don't try to make somebody think they've got to experience God like you do. If you want to be quiet, it's okay. If you want to be loud, it's okay. As long as it's authentic and has integrity. But don't try to impose your experience on somebody else. But anyway, Charles said his, his arms were burning up to his elbows and he was lying there. He said all of a sudden, it was like clouds swirling. And all of a sudden he said, I saw Jesus standing in front of me with his hands outstretched. And he said... From this time forth, you will be used in the gifts of healing. And then he, he was gone. And you can read this whole story. There was a tremendous revival. You know, we were so shy, we never told anybody. We didn't run out, the service started. We didn't tell anybody what happened. We never even told anybody what happened. <laughs> Some people never heard of it until I wrote that book just recently. <laughs> we never told anybody about this experience. But in spite of that, revival broke out in that little church. People started getting miraculously healed. People started getting saved, baptized in the Holy Spirit. The, 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 the place filled up and overflowed. People started coming from all over northeast Texas and southeast Oklahoma. And folks, the reason I'm telling you this, and it was right after this, I'll, I'll, I'll finish this story. So I knew God had, had called us. I got an invitation because my dad was a pastor. A little church in McAllister, Oklahoma asked me to come up and speak for them. And so I went up, and it was a senior citizen church. It's a very small Assembly of God church. And I, now I was young. I was probably about 24, 25 years old. And uh, the pastor was an older, white-haired man, and it seemed all the congregation, it was small, probably about 20 people there, and they were all senior citizens, and they sang the old songs out of the songbook, and they had a piano that was out of tune. A little old lady played the piano. And it was so dead and dry, and I preached my message the first night. Some of you heard me tell this story, but you haven't heard all of it, and I'm going to tell you the rest of it tonight. And, uh, and I was preaching message of faith and sozo and healing. Now, I didn't know about sozo the way I'm teaching you tonight, but I knew that, I believed that God healed. And so I asked if anybody wanted prayer, and there was a woman came up, and she was walking with a crutch, and she had this very pronounced limp as she came up on her crutch. And I asked her what she wanted prayer for, and she said, she had had surgery on her foot and had uh, some metal pins in it and she wanted healing. Well, I prayed for her and she hobbled back just like she came. And so uh, I did write out some scriptures about faith and healing and gave to her and I said, I believe God's going to heal you this week. She wasn't back. I, I was preaching Sunday through Friday night. She didn't come back until Friday night. But that week, every night, it was so dead. It was so dry. God felt like he was a million miles away. I wish so much that I had not committed myself to be there for six nights. I, the first night I wanted to leave so bad, especially when that woman didn't get healed, because it was so dead and dry. Nothing was happening. And, and uh, it, was, it was just a pain for me every night to get through the meeting. But I said to God, and this came out of the depths of my beings of being distressed, and crying out to God, I said, God, if you have called me to this kind of ministry, to, 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 to where you want to heal people and do miracles and, and healings, then, then I want to see you heal that woman this week. Now, I do not believe in trying to put God on the spot and say, well, God, if you'll do this, you know, this and so, I'll know this. But I have found in my life that sometimes when it really comes right down out of the core of your being, when your life is really on the line, you say, God, I've got to see this, that God will come through. But sometimes people do frivolous things. I know some, I know some people, they were, lived in Louisville, Kentucky, a couple, and they were wondering if they should, should uh, move to Tulsa, and, and they were in a Cracker Barrel restaurant, and they said, well, if we see three signs, if we, if we, when we come out of the car and we look in the, the parking lot, if there are three cars that have sevens in the license plate, we'll know where to go to Tulsa. <laughs> and so they came out, and they looked in the parking lot, ah, oh, there are three cars got sevens in the license plate. So they moved to Tulsa. <laughs> they didn't stay there long. <laughs> 
my friends do not relate to God frivolously. <laughs> but I have found when it comes down out of the core of your being, when, you're not, when your life is on the line, God will come through. God's a Savior. And that came out of the core of my being. It's like, God, if, if you've really called me to this, then I ask you to heal that woman this week. Every service was so dead and dry. It seemed God was a million miles away. When Friday night, I could hardly wait till the meeting was over to get out of there and go home. I was about an hour and a half from home. And so I preached my message out of obligation. I didn't feel like asking if anybody wanted prayer, but I preached the message of faith. How, what else could I do? There was only kind of message I knew how to preach. So I preached about God's faithfulness and healing power and everything, gave an invitation. For the first time, this crippled woman was back that had been there Sunday night that I'd prayed for. And she comes hobbling down on her crutch. And she's the one that after Sunday night, I'd given her a list of scriptures to read about healing. But I felt so dead. I felt so dry. Been feeling that way all week. That here's what I was thinking when she's walking down. I was thinking I should never have given her those scriptures. Because she's going to be so disappointed when she comes down here and we pray for her and nothing happens. I should not have gotten her hopes up. I shouldn't have given her those scriptures, gotten her hopes up. Because she's coming down here thinking God's going to heal her. And when she doesn't get healed, she's going to be really disappointed. Great man of faith <laughs> who's just preached the message of faith. <laughs> but you know, God had heard the cry of my heart that sometime earlier that week, I had said, God, if you've really called me to this, I ask you to heal that woman. You know what happened? I went down and laid my hand on that woman. And I began to pray. She picked up her crutch and walked back to her seat, threw it in the floor, lifted her hands and began to praise God. And for the first time all, in all week, the place came alive. And then she walked around the, 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 the auditorium showing that she was completely healed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And God confirmed, yes, I have called you. And this was around the same time this was happening to you, Sue. Yes, and Jen... Yes. Uh, Jan in Calgary says, I'm trembling. God has given me the same word. My heart resonates with the call to consecration. God is about to do signs and wonders like we have not seen before. This, is word, this word is true. And she's weeping. Thank you, Jan. Yes. Yes. You know, and there is, and Jan, that reminds me, there is a passage in the Old Testament. And I believe it was given to Joshua when they were about to go into the, cross the Jordan, go to the promised land. And God said to Joshua, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do signs and wonders in the land. And I believe God is saying that. He's, he's calling us, my friends. And this is, not a, uh, this is not a pursuit of sensationalism. Folks, this is the real deal. This is the real thing. I hate sensationalism. I hate it when people are just pursuing supposedly signs and wonders just to satisfy something in them. Wanting to be entertained by a sign and a wonder. That's not what, where we're at, my friends. This is believing God to do signs and wonders to confirm His Word, the message He has given us. So that it will rapidly spread all over the world. And so thank you, Jen. Yes, God is calling us to a new consecration to Him. Because in your life, He's going to do great and mighty things. Yes, sir. Carla Drennan uh, has just written this. She says, oh, new level of commitment and signs and wonders and miracles. That is what God has spoken to us this week. Exactly. We are so with you where you are, spiritually and naturally. We are with you in agreement and in partnership in every way that God says to do. And he also said, will you do whatever I tell you no matter what anyone thinks about it in the face of any kind of opposition? That's a, a key word. That's what consecration is. It's when you do what God has said. You're so in him and him in you that it doesn't matter what anybody says. You do what he has asked and you can count on him. She says, do not be afraid of their faces. He's been asking me, where are the signs and wonders in the church today? He was letting machetes hunger to see it. Uh, and he has been saying that scripture about being approved by the signs following the message we preach. And that is what is happening. 
Carla. Amen. Thank you, Carla. And, and for those of you in the prayer room, feel free to go ahead and start posting in the prayer room again. I always ask people to, you know, to come into the classroom, but feel free to go ahead, go in the prayer room, begin to post where uh, my message part has, is winding up. But yes, God has spoken to us tonight. Folks, I feel like I was telling Sue this. I have this sense. Something has happened in the, in, you know, it, basically when, we got, when God provided this studio in such a miraculous way, and it was, I think it was about six weeks ago now when I was with Charles and Delilah Hicks and God spoke to me and said, it's time. And I have, I've, I've had this sense, folks, we're, we're, that we've, we've entered into it. We, and I'm talking about you and I, I don't know about anybody else out there, but us, that we're entering into a new era, a new phase. And I was telling Sue this past week, and I feel, I feel this, that there's a sense, yes, I thank God He's allowed me to accomplish a few things for Him along the way, but there's a sense I have where that all of my life up to this time has been preparation for what He is now bringing forth. I'll say that again. I, have, I just sort of feel like inside that my life up to this time has been preparation for what He is now about to bring forth. And He's calling us to a, a greater consecration and believing Him for signs and wonders. Not to entertain ourselves, not to be entertained, not to entertain others. But to confirm His message and to draw people unto Himself. Yes. Oh, hallelujah. My friends, it's happening. Thank you all for your prayers and the time. Yes, God has prepared His people for this era. Um, I'm just wondering, Sarah, is that our friend Sarah up in uh, Idaho, Iowa? Is, is this uh, Stormy's mother? I'm, just, I'm not sure. There's a Sarah in the prayer room. Lord, we thank you tonight. Anybody got a prayer you want to just lift up to God in the prayer room or by email, just feel free to do it. And Lord, I thank you tonight. We, we come to you, Lord. <laughs> oh, and like those disciples of old, Lord, we lay it all down at your feet. Lord, we lay it down at your feet. And we say, Lord, we're yours. Lock, sock, and barrel. All that we are, all that we have, Lord, is yours. We thank you, sir, for who you are. God, every time, you know, folks, every time I come up to this, this studio, I'm in awe of what God has done. Setting us up with a broadcast quality studio. It's incredible. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, has, God is already doing marvelous things. And he's going to do more marvelous things in the days ahead. And Sue's going to put on the, our song. Yeah, well, you, you can. I think you can do it manually there on, on the machine. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we just do thank you tonight. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. Let's pray right now that God's sozo will flow out on this stream. People are needing saving. There might be somebody who needs saving from their sins and from the penalty of sins. They need God's forgiveness. Just look up and receive it tonight. There may be somebody tonight who needs to be sozoed from physical illness and malady. Somebody needs to be sozoed from, from, from some person, demon-inspired person who is attacking you. And, and, and I feel this tonight. There's somebody out there. There is a demon-inspired attack against you. It's coming through a person or through people. And God will save you from that attack. And we break that attack of the enemy that is coming through a person or people through this child of God. I break that attack in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, I thank you for saving, sozoing your child now from this scheme from this plan of the enemy against your child, we say it's broken and they are saved in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, as this stream goes forth tonight, thank you for sozoing, for saving your children wherever they need saving tonight. Lord, we pray for our friend Kitbok there in India tonight who's just returned. I don't know where all he's been. He's been to Thailand, Malaysia. God, bless Kitbok tonight. Save him. Save his home. Save his family in every area where they may need saving. Save them tonight, Lord. 
Save our friends out there tonight. Save them financially. Save them, oh God, from the destruction of the enemy. Save your people tonight. Intervene, oh God, we cry out to you. <laughs> oh, I feel a laughter coming up inside, folks. A note of victory. God is saving his people. God will save and he is saving his people tonight. Just let him save you right now. Let him hug you right now. Let him envelop you in his love right now in his arms and save you right now wherever you need saving. Let him pour out his love upon you tonight. Let him lavish you with his love and grace tonight. And know that you are one of his saved ones. You belong to him. Now I'm going to be quiet and just let this song play. When it's all been said and done Thank you, Jesus. Yes. There is just one thing